You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to Both Sides of the Prescription with your host, Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron. Both Sides of the Prescription brings together Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron to discuss pertinent medical issues from both an alternative and traditional medicine perspective. So now, please welcome the hosts of Both Sides of the Prescription, Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron. Hello, everybody, and welcome to both sides of the Prescription Radio Show on BBM Global. Tune in and iHeartRadio. It is Wednesday night, and that means that I, uh, Dr. Megan Kirschling, and my father, Dr. Ron Kirschling, hello, Dad. Hello, Megan. Have come together to join forces to tackle uh, the most pertinent co- conversations that should be have that we should be having in uh, healthcare. So not so easy for me to say, but that's what brings us together tonight. So we come together every Wednesday night with the goal of discussing healthcare topics and wellness topics and just overall general. Um, really lifestyle topics that uh, look at both sides of medicine. So we're looking at both alternative care and practices and also traditional care. And uh, as most of you know that have listened before, we sort of come from the same household, but two different healthcare models. And I'm sort of the alternative leg of the conversation, even though I will say, Father, as we continue uh, having these conversations and we continue this radio show, I think we are sort of coming somewhere in the middle together, which I think was the goal. But um, I am the alternative part of it. Uh, I am Dr. Megan Kirschling, and I have a practice in Minnesota, right outside of the Twin Cities area. And I practice uh, both alternative and traditional medicine. I am a chiropractor, nurse practitioner, and a certified clinical nutritionist. And each day I see patients um, really throughout the whole spectrum of health and wellness and disease, from individuals that have been diagnosed with diseases like cancer, fibromyalgia, Lyme disease, mold toxicity, things like that, and want to take an approach a little bit different than what maybe the answers and options they're getting from traditional medicine, to people that come in uh, athletes and other individuals who just want to make sure they're really living their optimal life. And I'm really excited about our conversation tonight because we're going to get into the conversation of how do we create a healing environment. And this is a conversation not only when it comes to uh, healthcare providers and, you know, really creating a healing environment around an individual, but also just us as people, how, you know, do we create an environment where we can heal, where we can have the ability to get to that frequency of healing that is necessary? And it's just fascinating to me because I think the more and more that I practice, the more and more it's these parts of healthcare that I think are lacking. I think these are the things that a lot of times, especially in the United States model, we even consider this like voodoo medicine. We consider this like, why? well, why should we worry about some of these things? And, you know, this stuff will just come naturally or this stuff doesn't matter. And I think it's just the opposite. I, this is the foundation to me for healing. This is the foundation of what's important. And this is really the base of what is necessary because if this isn't here, there, and that um, both that uh, relationship between the provider and the person is not there, but if it's not there for the person in general, if they don't have a healing environment, then really what we're learning and what we can, I think, even decipher just by what should be a little bit of like common sense or what we know just from being humans is that it's almost impossible 
to heal when we don't feel safe and secure and trust what we're doing. So I'm excited to have this conversation, but first let's uh, introduce and get a little information about the person that will be having the conversation with me, and that is my father, Dr. Ron Kirschling. So Megan, uh, I, as you know, am traditionally trained as a medical oncologist, uh, first in internal medicine and then in the specialty of medical oncology. And your comments were interesting to me because um, I, I think, uh, fortunately, this this in fact may be a situation where we're becoming we're understanding this better. But particularly when we talk about cancer, um, it is interesting that um, we talk much more about the issue of curing um, rather than the issue of healing. And in fact, uh, I know that in the United States, uh, we're, it's very popular for us to declare war wars on things. But one of the um, one of the things in my lifetime that happened was uh, under the uh, President Richard Nixon, the declaration of uh, a war on cancer, uh, with the idea that we were going to cure this disease. And uh, in fact, we we have uh, made progress with regard to handling cancer. And we are, we now cure over 50% of people that have the diagnosis of cancer. But when we look at cancer as an example of chronic illness, uh, honestly, we've tended not to make a lot of progress in terms of cure, although we have made progress in terms of extension of life. And, and that brings to question whether our main focus when, when we are dealing with illness should be cure, always, or whether or not uh, we should be concerned more with healing. Uh, there's a favorite quote that um, uh, is by a Dr. Rachel Remen, R-E-M-E-N, uh, a, woman, a woman physician who ha- uh, has authored a number of books, all of which I would recommend. And uh, she is traditionally trained, uh, I believe, family practitioner. And her quote was this, we thought we could cure everything, but it turns out we can cure only a small amount of human suffering. The rest of it needs to be healed. And um, and hopefully, we're going to discuss some topics around that tonight, but hopefully this is an area that can infiltrate more into traditional medicine, this idea of uh, helping patients dealing with suffering to be healed. And I think it's a, it's a, a wonderful area to kind of look at the interface that occurs between uh, different health providers in terms of uh, how they balance this cure versus uh, healing aspect of uh, management. And this topic makes me really reflective um, of even my time um, in the healthcare world um, from an organ transplant nurse to a nurse practitioner to a chiropractor to working with the army that a lot of times I feel like we do when we're getting into a relationship with a patient in the sense of trying to build that trust and build that relationship and foundation for that uh, patient uh, doctor relationship that a lot of times we then answer the question, how are we going to cure you? And it gives so much power um, and what the research really shows and what you can really sort of even decipher as both a practitioner and a patient, it gives so much power to the disease. But we rarely really ask, how are we going to heal you? And it really is mind boggling when you think about it, because it really seems like we should be coming from a place more of how are we going to heal that person versus cure that disease? Yeah, it is interesting. You know, even the context is so much different between cure and healing. When you're talking about healing, about cure, excuse me, you're almost always talking about a specific disease. But when you're talking about healing, it really doesn't matter what the condition is. What you're actually doing is trying to help the patient um, in how they're able to hold the condition and how they're able to internally handle it. Um with the kind of paradoxical understanding that an individual may not be cured, but they may be healed, and that that may actually be um, a more 
a, a more satisfying effect on the quality of their life if they can be healed. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I think is really fascinating about this conversation is when we talk about curing um, and we look at it as a sort of maybe a cure model that we're going after, you know, trying to cure a disease, it really does take away individualization and it's more based on find the disease, find the ill, find the pill, you know, find um, and diagnose the disease. That's what we're going to cure. And this is how we're going to cure it. We're going to, you know, use chemotherapy or we're going to use a medication or we're going to use, you know, if it's diabetes, we're going to use medicine. Foreman, you know, if it's anxiety, we're going to use Zoloft. Um, when we talk about healing, it really does take an individualized approach to of how do we create a healing environment for that person. And I actually have an interesting story just even from today where um, I have a patient uh, and I have known both him and his wife for a really long time and they're both wonderful people. But as sometimes we find in couples, they have very, they have two very different mindset. He is a very I think by nature, he's a little bit more of, I would say a laid back um, would be sort of how I'd uh, paint him Um, and likes to know just the simple facts, but doesn't want to get into any of the details, just wants to know enough that he can sort of understand it um, and wants to know a plan, very task focused, very analytical, that kind of, you know, nature. She is, um, she's a retired nurse, um, but she is very, very into, I've got to make sure that I'm researching as much as possible. She's a nurturer by nature. Um, and so he's been going through some health um, concerns. And of course, this sets up both of them to be worried and concerned and, um, you know, what are they going to do about this and this? And um, they both go into, uh, you know, the mode of, okay, he, he goes into the mode of what am I going to do? And I just need to start to do it. I want to be in motion. She goes into the mode of let me gather as much facts as possible. And you can tell is like, she's, I'm meeting with both of them and she's going through this, that it's really like, um, too much for him. Like he really is becoming like frustrated with all the details. And so we talked about this and I said, you know, it's interesting because I think the first thing we have to do is figure out how are we going to create a healing environment for the individual, for the husband. And his healing environment is definitely going to be different than hers. And that we have to also, you know, and I said to her, like, I think all of this stuff, you need to bring it to me and we need to decipher, you know, the information and whatnot. But, and he said, all I want is for you got you two then to come to me and say, this is what we're going to do. And, you know, I said, I think this is the most important conversation we're going to have overall. And what I said to him is what I've learned is that if you do not create a healing environment specific to that person, then it, you can throw them the best therapies. You know, we can research until we're blue in the face and, um, you know, find all the best therapies and throw them at him. But if he isn't in a place where he is in a healing environment, he's not even going to be receptive to that therapy. And so I really think we don't do enough to create healing environments. Well, that's it. That's an interesting example be, because uh, you really are dealing with the process of two clients that you're working with. Uh, one that's been identified that's unwell, uh, but another one that is likely going to be instrumental in certain ways as whether or not the unwell uh, person is going to get better. Mm-hmm. And um, certainly when when we look at individuals, it's important that we understand that uh, they're hopefully they're not isolated. They're mm-hmm. social beings and they have critical people that are important in their healing process. And so I would uh, put forward that um, if you ignored the wife, or if she became dissatisfied with the care because uh, her needs were not being met, that ultimately would uh, would harm your exactly the, the the husband that's kind of been identified as a patient. Well, and that's the important part of this too is that it's a healing environment with a healing team, and she's much more even of that healing team than I am. Um, but you know, when it comes down to it, like she needs to make sure that she has done all the research that she has done everything that she can to nurture and, you know, provide care. And that's great. I mean, that's a 
perfect person to have on a healing team. And so, like I said to her, is it's like, you don't have to stop doing that. We just have to do that in a way that we can then take that information and process it in a way that it's not overwhelming to him. And that's why I think it is really important to put all of those, you know, things into play when we're creating a healing environment, which includes the team around you that's going to help you and be a part of that healing environment. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think um, that's a, a critical point that um, in the process of healing, you're not dealing with an individual, you're dealing with somebody who is in a social context. And if you ignore that, um, likely the healing environment is going to be affected by that. I mean, I think that's a re- really important point. And uh, no, no matter whether you're talking about chiropractic care, dietary care, um being a medical oncologist, you you wouldn't want to forget or minimize that kind of process. Right. And the other thing that, you know, and like I actually did use this um, analogy, but it's true that if we don't create an environment where that person feels safe and secured, listened to, that they trust, but then also that we cater it to, you know, how they're going to best be able to take that information. And I mean, I think we both have dealt with patients that want every little piece of information. They want to understand every little thing. And we have other patients that that would actually just overwhelm them. And that's where I think it really does have to be customized. So we're going to take a break um, for the first commercials, but everybody stick with us. You are listening to both sides of the prescription on BBM Global, Tune In, and iHeartRadio. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Welcome back, everybody, to both sides of the prescription radio show. If you guys want to join in, uh, have if you have any questions, comments, concerns, uh, give us a call at 866-451-1451. So, Megan, uh, w- with you talking about that uh, situation, I it brought to mind actually a case that I saw today. And um, I think it fits into the discussion that we're having. And this is a woman that I've cared for now um, for over a year who has a breast cancer problem. And uh, uh, the situation is that um, she is coming to a final decision regarding uh, a, a therapy that I don't manage a form of radiation therapy. And um, she is, was undecided about whether she wanted to proceed with the therapy and asked if she could uh, visit with me before her visit with the radiation oncologist to help her in decision-making. 
but what was interesting about this is that um, she did not come in alone. Uh, she came in with her husband, her sister, her, her daughter, and the grand and her grandson. And um, during the conference, she spoke um, occasionally, but the conversation was really dominated by her daughter and her sister. And her comment about this was that that was what she wanted, that mm -hmm. she wanted to have um, have them lead the discussion. She, she wanted uh, them to ask questions. And although I think that she was helped by the actual conversation that we had, she said, well, you know what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go home with all these people and I'm going to digest it when we're going to we're going to talk through it. So she was present for this. But in terms of being uh, participating, her family will really were much, much more active in it. And that's what she wanted, because she really wanted to talk to her family. But she wanted to make sure that uh, they had all the information they needed as well as she needed in, in order to have that very important discussion as a, as a family. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think the experience for her would have been as enriching if, um, if simply she had, you know, come in and talked to me about the, this particular part of her care. Mm -hmm. And I've actually even seen this um, from some of my patients that have had to, well, have had a diagnosis of cancer. And uh, I have had a patient that even said, you know, it was more important actually for her family members to be at peace with what she did. Um, and she had sort of gone through a couple of rounds. Um, but I, if I remember correctly, because it's been a couple of years ago when she went through this um uh, that during the time she had, I think, opted to do only, she hadn't, they had maybe suggested maybe three or four rounds of chemo and she did one or two. And she had felt at the time um, very good with her decision and she felt that, you know, she had made the right decision. But, you know, she had said that the hard thing was to really make sure that her family was okay with her decision and that, you know, they spent more time making sure they were okay, um, which, and I do think that that's, I think all of our story, the three stories that we just told all sort of reflect to that a lot of times when there is health concerns, it's a little bit harder on the family too. You know, it sort of puts that person going through it into, okay, I need to, you know, do this and I need to fight this and I need to stay positive, but it sort of creates a um, struggle for family and loved ones. Oh, I mean, there's no, there's no question about it. Uh, when we are talking about um, something as significant as a cancer, although you have the patient with cancer as the identified patient, uh, those people who serve as caregivers, whether they're spouses or significant others or other family members, uh, in some ways are dealing with even more stress than the patient uh, because they want to help and sometimes how they can help uh, can be perplexing, can be frustrating, can can appear to be unsatisfying. So mm -hmm. I think it's uh, it is important that you recognize the uh, the stress uh, of a family unit or of a the kind of community around a patient. What percentage of your patients do you think bring a family member to their appointment? Well, um, for example, today, I would say that it was over 50%. Okay. Do you think that's, do you think you see about 50%? I would say that it's at, um, it's at least 50%. Okay. Uh, now, there, there are different visits when you went to go to a cancer center. So, uh, for example, um, if you have a patient who is um, to start new therapy, or is to undergo a um, reevaluation. In those situations, literally, it's almost a hundred percent that patients will bring other family members in. 
Uh, on the other hand, if you're dealing with somebody that's uh, gone through treatment and is just having routine follow-up, maybe a couple years out, uh, they may they may come in individually because they're not expecting that they're going to get uh, unfavorable news. Or if you have a patient who's on a treatment and is stable on the treatment, um, they may not come in. Now, I, I should say that um, in my practice, uh, my practice involves not only physicians, but also uh, nurse practitioners. And um, when patients uh, know that they're going to see me, oftentimes that's in a setting where they're going to get some information about their cancer. And uh, so it's much more common for me to see patients with other family members than it is a nurse practitioner, but it's just due the, to, to the nature of the visit. Okay. Because I would think, obviously, with your specialty, you would probably get more of the family unit involved um, with the care than, you know, we see in primary care, even, you know, in my holistic uh, practice, I don't actually get a lot of people coming in with family members. Yeah, and and um, I, I think the important thing is just to allow an open environment so that they yeah. know know that family members can come in. Um, sometimes I have patients who have family members come, but they don't have them actually come into the visit. I mean, they uh, they they want to be in the visit alone. So I um, it really isn't a decision that I make. It's more of a an idea of allowing them. The freedom to um, to do uh, to f- formulate the visit how they feel most uh, uh, safe and comfortable. Mm-hmm. Well, and I know the other thing that we wanted to discuss tonight is sort of how to create an environment that can foster change. And what we mean by that is that when we're looking at the healing journey and creating an environment that is. Um, geared towards healing, one of the things that has to come with that is change. Um, you know, it obviously when you get a diagnosis or when uh, you find out something about your health, that things have to change. And so we wanted to also talk about how to not only create a healing environment, but also how to create an environment that fosters change. Yeah, there's a, a couple of ways we can go at this, Megan. Um, and I think maybe we should we should try to get both of them in. But uh, there are a, a couple wonderful books that we've um, been exposed to that kind of look at this uh, this question f- from different perspectives. Uh, one of the books is called Healers, and it's by uh, the authors are Schmidt and Churchill, and it it talks about characteristics of uh, what they call extraordinary clinicians. And I think um, I think that's very instructive as to how you in a individual case uh, healer to patient uh, how do you set up that atmosphere and then another book that we've ran into is um, a book called change for good uh, which is by Prochaska and sort of looks at the uh, process of uh, how you can sort of see where people are in a decision process and how you can um, help them move towards change. And the uh, information about or the uh, Prochaska change, uh, once we get into that, I think some people will maybe have heard of some of that before because it talks about like stages and how do we go from, you know, just thinking about change to really engaging in change. But I do think that this is so important as healers that we do sort of help to guide this because I think in order to really get somebody to where they need to be, it's not just about that first part of the um, relationship, which we really, I think, put a lot of emphasis on, which is diagnosis and treatment. Um, but it really is then moving into how do we use this to help the person um, foster an environment where they can change and use this then as growth? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this may come up more in your practice than it may be in mine, in, in, only in the sense that um, for better or worse, in a medical oncology practice, oftentimes uh, what what I'm doing to people is um, 
uh, therapies that um, I basically explain and then direct. Whereas, um, and sometimes I think, not saying that I agree with it, but sometimes sort of looking at the patient in terms of what we can externally do. Whereas I think um, your practice, you you are a lot more in turn in tune to uh, what can we do to allow the person in, internally to to bring health to the uh, to the situation. Well, I think what we should do is take a break and then come back and let's talk about the first book you talked about, Healers, um, and Extraordinary Clinicians at Work and extrapolate some of the things that we can learn from them on how we can become better healers. So stick with us. You're listening to both sides of the prescription. Psychologist, master certified coach, and CEO of the executive and organizational development firm True North Leadership, Dr. Relly Nadler brings his expertise in emotional intelligence to keynotes, consulting, coaching, and training. He is the author of Leader's Playbook and Leading with Emotional Intelligence that lays out tips and tools for effective leadership. Dr. Nadler has designed multi day executive boot camps for high achievers in Fortune 500 companies and has coached CEOs, presidents, and their staff and developed and delivered innovative leadership programs for such organizations as Anheuser-Busch, BMW, MCI, EDS, DreamWorks Animation, the U.S. Navy, and Vanguard Health Systems. To learn more and get your free iPhone app highlighting his tools with videos, leadership keys, visit www.truenorthleadership.com today. Welcome back, everybody, to both sides of the prescription radio show. So, Megan, uh, this book called Healers uh, looks at uh, features of clinicians that um, that in fact would be characterized more from what we said earlier in this uh, broadcast as uh, healers rather than uh, people that are. Um, necessarily dominated by the idea of curing somebody. And there were eight features that they suggested, and all of them I certainly agree with. So the first one was be sure that you do the little things when you meet a person to allow them to be comfortable. And it's kind of amazing but um, in the studies that they've done, it appears that it literally only takes seconds from the introduction f- for the patient to decide if they're going to like you or not or trust you or not. I mean, literally seconds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it is. It's a very, you know, it's a very primitive part of us is that, you know, we have to make these, you know, split decisions about what we think of somebody so that we know if we're safe or not. And in the healing environment, I mean, we really have to know if we're safe or not. And if we have decided we don't like somebody, then we're really never going to get to a place where we allow ourselves to have that safety. And I've really learned that safety is an important, important thing to have if you're ever going to build any kind of healing environment. If that person doesn't feel safe and secure and that they can trust their surroundings, then primitively, they're never going to be at a place where their cells are going to be open up to healing. And we know that when you don't feel safe and secure, your cells close up on each other. You know, that's Bruce Lipton's The Biology of Belief, that your cells are not open and reactive and interactive, I should say, with the environment. Instead, they're closed off and um, closed up. The second thing that they mention is to uh, take time and listen. And uh, this is an interesting point because oftentimes uh, when clinicians hear a comment like this, they say, well, that's fine and good. I would do it. But, you know, I um, I don't have time to do that. But, but the reality of the situation is that um, what it's really saying here is that you – have to develop the skill of real listening. 
it's uh, sometimes uh, very sobering when they when they do studies to look at the length of time that a typical traditional clinician will wait before interrupting a patient when they ask a question. And again, um, somewhat embarrassingly, I have to say that it, you know usually it's only a matter of seconds. I think um, I think it's somewhere around 12 to 13 seconds, typically or on average, before the uh, clinician interrupts the uh, the patient. And what we're saying here is um, it's not necessarily a matter of having to take extra time. It, it's a quality of the time that you're spending with the patient. And I think there are a lot of ways to listen to a patient. You know, you can even get good paper, you know, initial paperwork and really read it and look at it and, you know, really get that person's story, get that person's, you know, timeline of events and what's occurred. You can get what matters to that person, what their goals are. Um, and those are ways that you can listen to them and listen to them, not just treat their disease. Cause I think that's the other thing too, is that people want to know that you understand them as a person, not that you're coming at them as, you know, a diabetic. The third one is interesting because, you know, I, when I, when I look at how I typically approach a visit, uh, I like to go into the visit prepared. And and that means not only knowing kind of the purpose of the visit, but also how I think the visit should go, um, what I'm trying to communicate in the visit. But it's interesting that when this book looked at this, their point was the importance to the patient of the healer being open, which meant um, being vulnerable and looking for the unspoken. And it, it makes me... Uh, recognize that um, that there's no reason that I can't allow that patient to be vulnerable. You know, I it it has nothing to do with my skill level, uh, but it has more to do with how I allow that patient to express what they really need in the visit. And. I like to, you know, when you're talking about this, I also think it's important not to immediately shut down something else that they're doing. You know, I think a lot of times all across the board, traditional and alternative, that if they're doing something else, that we automatically just question them, well, why are you doing that? And I think that's a very hard thing to hear as a patient whose goal is the same as yours. They just want to get better and know that they're doing everything possible to get better. Another thing they mentioned that's kind of along the same line is the idea of allowing the patient to explain. And I think uh, one of the things that we've certainly seen um, in functional medicine in the teaching of it, and I think something that's very true is it can be very important for the patient for a number of different reasons to simply be able to tell their story, how they want to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things, too, is that I, when I sit down with a patient, I do have pretty um, extensive uh, initial paperwork. And then I actually sit down for almost that first hour and just talk to them. Um, you know, I just sit down and go over it and go over the series of events and whatnot. And the thing that I've noticed, probably 75% of my patients, when we start to talk about things, they'll say, well, I'll go really quickly through this part. And, you know, it'll be about how, you know, for the first six years of their life that they had ear tubes and chronic infections and, you know, allergies and asthma and were hospitalized for 20 days. And, you know, they want to go over that really fast because they don't want to waste my time. And, you know, when I say to them, no, I need to know this, like we need to go over this, you know, they're almost shocked that I would care about something that happened to them 30 years earlier. But, you know, it sort of tells you what they're sort of used to is that, you, that they have to get everything through really fast and that, you know, they're only allowed to talk about one thing that, you know, if they come in and are complaining about a headache, well, next time I'll tell you about the fact that, you know, I have constipation. No, let's talk about this all together because it might just be linked and people aren't used to that. Yeah. Another thing they mentioned that I think is really interesting is, and I think that the really the only way you can do that is if you you do what you just mentioned, Megan, um, you allow um, you 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 allow people to try to connect everything, but also you allow them to to, to 
for 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 them to kind of show their nature. But an interesting thing that's been mentioned is that it's important to find something to like or love about the patient. And um, that's interesting because I think that that really talks to the relationship that you want to develop with the patient. Mm -hmm. And I like this one because I think it's a good thing for us to all practice in everyday life with, you know, you don't have to be a healer. You don't have to be a provider or a doctor. I mean, we can do this with anybody, you know, Um, if we are talking to our mother-in-law who we don't like, you know, um, then what we can say though, is that I really appreciate, you know, that, she is the mother of my husband or without her, I wouldn't have a husband, you know, or I really love how much she cares about her family. Like there's always something good you can find and it changes automatically the relationship that you have with that person. Um, and it's very, I think important as a provider, you know, we all have patients that might be a little bit more draining to us. Um, but when you don't look at them as that they're draining, but be like, you know, I really appreciate that this person brings a lot of information, um, that, you know, I can, learn from, you know, or I really appreciate that this person is very passionate about their health care. Those are things that automatically change the way we look at that person. And it automatically instantly changes the um, relationship. There are some uh, the qualities of the healer that seem to be essential. And uh, two of those are humility and trustworthiness. And uh, obviously, that's something that the patient has to feel at the first visit, but something also that deals with your capacity to stay with the patient, to to let them know that you're going to be there as a um, a, a, a a a duet or a do uh, a a combination that of people that will stay with them through through their care. And it's interesting because when you look just at, I I don't want to say an individual or individuals in our healthcare, but if you look at the general healthcare model, it really is lacking a lot of humility and it's lacking a lot of trustworthiness. Like I think a lot of less people or a lot of less people, a lot less people these days really trust their healthcare. And I think that a lot less people, you know, really, I, I don't think that a majority of people would describe their practitioner as humble. Yeah, very good points. And then the final point of the eight points was the capacity to share authority. And uh, this is, I think, an area that's a lot harder for uh, physicians in traditional medicine than it may be maybe for other providers or for pro- or, or for providers in non-traditional venues such as you're in, Megan. Uh, but the idea that your relationship isn't a vertical relationship. Uh, but a horizontal relationship, uh, a participatory relationship uh, it is very powerful for the patient in terms of them being able to accept responsibility for their for their care and their health. Mm-hmm. And I really, again, like this one, too, because um, so. I last uh, week got a letter of somebody who was very un uh, was not happy with care, and I appreciated that so much. Um, and I did like talk to her right away because I was like, "Thank you so much for verbalizing this." But one of her things was that one of the people that she saw at the clinic, um, who's very very good, I rarely get complaints, and this might have been even the first complaint I've ever gotten about this provider. Um, that she just felt like she wasn't listened to. And she felt like when she tried to give feedback, the other person, the provider had just said, no, I've seen this before. Like, this is what we need to do. And the provider was coming from a good place. Like she was trying to say, I'm going to work you through this. But I really think, you know, in retrospect, what had happened was she didn't allow that person to have authority that even though she was coming from the right place and wasn't trying to be, you know, necessarily a dictator of what was going on and trying to say, look, no, I know this is going to be good for you at the end. That person, again, it doesn't even matter if what she was doing was the right thing. That person had lost authority and had lost trust in what was happening and therefore had a bad experience. And so that's where this stuff is so important because no matter then what we're doing, what therapies we're giving, it does not matter if we do not create the right healing environment and provide the right healer qualities. Yeah. So reviewing those, uh, do the little things, 
take time to listen, be open, looking for the unspoken, find something to like or to love, remove barriers by practicing humility, let the patient explain, share authority, and be committed and trustworthy. Certainly eight very important aspects of uh, caring for patients, and, and I think appropriately criteria that uh, that move you towards the issue of uh, try, trying to set up a relationship that helps to heal a patient. Definitely. So, all right, well, let's take our last break, but let's come back and talk about the stages of change and um, how to incorporate uh, change uh, in a healing environment. So stick with us. You're listening to both sides of the prescription. Renaissance woman, trailblazer, maverick. Those are just some of the words to describe to Chandra Poulard, owner and CEO of House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC, a woman minority veteran owned entertainment company based in Washington, D.C. Ms. Poulard served 10 years honorably in the United States Navy and departed from active duty to pursue her dreams of becoming an entertainment mogul. House of Virgo Entertainment offers script writing, producing, directing, DJ services, editing, and more. They cater to businesses, corporations, college students, working professionals, aspiring artists and nonprofit organizations, and employ veterans of the armed forces. Tashandra Poulard is pioneering the way we view media and taking her brand global. Visit her at www.houseofvirgoentertainment.com or call 281-515-3740 and like her on Facebook at House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC. Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment?, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various business interests through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. Welcome back, everybody, to both sides of the prescription radio show. So, Megan, we wanted to take this last segment and I think deal with uh, a very important point that all healthcare providers should should reflect on, and that is um, understanding where a patient might be in the decision process. And as we, as I mentioned before, uh, there is a book called Change for Good that uh, really outlines this, I think, very succinctly and uh, in a very understandable way. And one of the things that they do in the book is that they um, they look at different phases that a patient may be in, and they describe five of them, uh, one being pre-contemplation, the second contemplation, the next preparation, the next action, and finally maintenance. Now, uh, we'll quickly go over those, but I think there were some really important ancillary points. One of them is that in reality, knowing where the patient is is very important because really any goal that's going to be generated is only going to be accomplished if the client or the patient wants it. And secondly, when you look at those uh, phases, you might think, well, people go from one to the next to the next, but they emphasize in the book that it's very rare that someone just goes through those phases without uh, falling back, uh, having setbacks, recycling, and in fact, going back and forth between phases is actually more normal than abnormal. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, you know, 
a great point is that when we look at this, I think it's important for us to see which phase we're in because that's going to dictate sort of what we provide to the patient, what information we provide, but that the person can easily go from maybe, you know, pre-contemplation to um, contemplation to, you know, an action step, but then all of a sudden come back and say, whoa, what's going on? And maybe go back to contemplation. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the point. And that necessarily, I mean, that could be an atmosphere in which uh, the provider might be discouraged um, or the, the client might be discouraged, but they really d- don't have to be because that seems to be more kind of the natural progression of decision making. Mm-hmm. And the other part of it, too, is, I mean, we talk about people going back and forth, but I mean, I've even had patients that go back and forth in a two minute time period, you know, and um, and that just sort of goes to show you, too, that you've got to sort of meet the patient with where they're at. Um And a lot of times, too, if they're sort of going back and forth, I think they want it sort of simplified into, okay, this is what we're going to do. And let's then try to get into like a movement forward. And then we can come back and maybe look at some of this other contemplation after we're moving forward. Yeah. And and I would think particularly in your practice, Megan, where you're very focused on, on clients making individual decisions, uh, really being active in the decision making, it's uh, kind of critical to determine when a person comes in, uh, I guess you might say how serious they are. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things I think go into this. Uh, Now, I will say that I've been really lucky in the sense of I usually uh, only have patients that come in that are uh, definitely not in the pre-contemplation. Uh, I have patients that come in a lot more in that contemplation or, uh, you know, even maintenance, but I definitely have it more in the sense where they're ready to do something about it. They've already decided to do something about it um, and invest in, you know, functional medicine and alternative care and that then they're really good patients. So to, to, to just kind of clarify, pre-contemplation is a situation where the individual may may not even have expressed really the intent to do it. The example that I might use there is a husband that's brought in by the wife and the wife has some intent for the husband, but he's really only there to keep peace. And he's not made uh, really any any attempt or desires to make any attempt to change. Whereas contemplation would be a situation where uh, there is thinking on a part of the individual that they want to change, uh, but they certainly haven't reached the point where they're um, willing to actually commit. And the contemplation phase sometimes can, I think, be the longest phase, at least it is in my personal experience, uh, because people can kind of get stuck at that phase. Yeah, I definitely uh, agree with you there. And I think that that's why it's sort of important to create that healing environment is to help them know they're safe and can move forward into action. And then preparation is kind of the, as I understand it, kind of the first signal that uh, a person's willing to take action. So it might be a small step. Uh, it might be as simple as something announcing a, per, a person announcing to other people in their uh, social community that uh, they're going to do something. But it's uh, it's actually the um, first movement forward uh, to to set up a uh, developed action plan. Uh, and I do think that when you look at this uh, and that first sort of step is that it's interesting because I think once that starts to happen, I think you know, things sort of go a little bit faster. This is where you sort of gain inertia. Yeah. Now, you know, I I think that um, there probably is a a sense of excitement or resilience or determination that kind of happens that allows that preparation to move into action. But, you know, probably as valuable as getting a person to the point of action is the recognition after you've developed a plan and the person may have made uh, some successful um, maneuvers in their life to help is uh, not to discount the the importance or the essential nature of uh, maintenance. Mm -hmm. Um, And so what do they say about maintenance? Well, 
it is actually, as I guess all of these phases are, is actually for, for the for the um, provider is a matter of helping or being open to the client to see what they want to use as their guidepost to tell that they're still on the it, it, uh, going in the right direction. So it's mentioned that it's much more successful uh, to maintain a, a, quali- a quality of life issue if the client is the one making the determination what that is versus the provider saying, well, this is these are the things that we're going to set as things that we um, want to maintain. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it is interesting because when we get to maintenance, like you were saying too, is that it is very individualized. And I think that uh, when we look at maintenance, it's sort of dependent on what somebody wants to maintain, but then how to take those steps to do it. I think the other important thing for providers is to understand that their availability has to be as great during the maintenance phase as it may be during the action phase, because if a patient does fall back, uh, they need to have that capacity to go to the um, to the provider and uh, seek uh, to get help to get back on track. One of the things that I found to be really powerful about this is that when somebody gets onto what I would consider maintenance and we have treated sort of what we wanted to treat, you know, a lot of times I'll tell them to follow up like in two months, maybe after we feel like things are better. But I always do say, or if things change. And I think that that's pretty powerful too, because then people realize like, okay, you know, I have to look for if anything's going backwards because I want to stay in this maintenance, not go back to where I was. So, Megan, uh, we've covered quite a bit of ground tonight. We, uh, I think, uh, really brought up this interesting contrast between healing and curing, talking about the necessity for us to reflect a little bit more on what we can do to help patients heal, respecting the fact that healing is very individualized and that it often requires us to realize that it's not just the patient but the team or community around them. We told some stories, I think, that kind of relate to this. And then the latter half of our broadcast here was uh, dealing with some really valuable information for providers uh, with regard to what a healer looks like. And then finally, um, looking at phases that clients or patients may go through uh, that allow them to make up action plans and stay on them. So I think... Overall, I mean, I love this conversation. I think it's such an important one. Um, Once again, I thank you for uh, having this conversation uh, with me on Wednesday. And I hope everybody joins us for another conversation next Wednesday, 9 p.m. Eastern, on both sides of the prescription on BBM Global, TuneIn, and iHeartRadio. You've been listening to Both Sides of the Prescription with your host, Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron. So many times, people are only given one side of the healthcare story. Here, you get both sides. Tune in next week as we discover Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron's both sides of the prescription. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.